Bene, vedo che, che ci siete tutti, e siamo, anche, siamo anche live su Steam. Uh, questa è la seconda edizione in presenza dell'iniziativa Quiz uh, Europa, la prima edizione appunto nel, nel sabato nel 2019, un'iniziativa che uh, è patrocinata dal Parlamento Europeo e che uh, deve la sua esistenza all'Associazione Spazio e Humanities e eh, l'Ambro. Um, Quest'anno abbiamo uh, deciso di impostare il, uh, il formato con una piccola scuola, con delle lezioni, di cui la lezione d'apertura è mattina tenuta da uh, Helen Moore la cui partecipazione è sostenuta dal Art Council uh, England e siamo anche molto contenti di poter avere uh, UK quest'anno perché nel 2019 non era stato possibile. So we are very happy to have um, someone from UK, from England, because in 2019 that was not possible. So you are the first uh, uh, English poet or eco poet, uh, and you will uh, explain it better to us the meaning uh, according to your poetics as well. Uh, it's, yeah, so it, I think that it's a very good sign for um, European uh, artists or to, to, to join together and to give a, a, a sign that can also in a good balance with all the um, politics and <laughs> political and economical uh, sides of the of the matter. So um that quindi io veramente vi uh, ringrazio ma ringrazio anche e soprattutto ARPA uh, che, che ci consente di essere qui, questo è il centro ARPA del, dell'isola Provese. Uh, e anche la provincia di Perugia, ovviamente, e il comune di Castiglione del Vago. Um, poi ci sono ovviamente anche tanti uh, altri, alt altre istituzioni da ringraziare, come il Forum Austriaco di Cultura, che ha sostenuto la partecipazione di Margaret Cryle uh, e uh, l'Istituto Cervantes, che ha sostenuto José Maria Mico. E niente, quindi eh, non mi dilungo ancora di più. Eh, e niente, lascio tutta la parola a Helen Moore per la sua, per la sua lezione. E niente, vi ringrazio per aver aderito eh, a questa ecco, piccola scuola diciamo, che eh, abbiamo organizzato per quest'anno, nonostante eh, i vincoli e le limitazioni eh, del Covid. Grazie a tutti voi, grazie a Eden e buon inizio. Thank you so much, welcome. Um, I also just want to briefly extend my thanks to ARPA, to Arts Council England, to Maria and her group uh, for inviting me here. And also to my dear friend Massimo D'Arcangelo, fellow eco poet, uh, who has helped me greatly to travel here and to, to, be, to be well here. So I'm so happy to be here and uh, to, to share something of eco -poet poetry um, to this audience and also to feel the solidarity with uh, European writers and poets. Uh, post-Brexit, which has been a very traumatic event for the British psyche. So it feels wonderful to, to be here to feel this solidarity. So thank you. So uh, I put my title first in Italian, um, Poesia, Paesaggio, la poesia come atto riparatore. Um, I'm going to speak in, in English, um, so the, the translation, poetry, landscape, eco-poetry as restorative act. Um, so 
I want to just begin by taking a moment to invite us to contemplate not only this beautiful place, Isola Polvese, but also uh, this incredible planet Earth that we inhabit, that is our home, our wider body, the miracle that life exists here, this superorganism, according to the scientist James Lovelock, uh, the name Gaia, uh, there are many other names for our home. Um, but yeah, just to acknowledge this incredible miracle of life and to, to celebrate life. So I wanted to make a summary of my intention for this lecture. Um, so I want to explore how in examining and decolonizing notions of landscape, I show how eco-poetry is an interdisciplinary practice with its roots in animistic European traditions. And so by animistic, I have a sense of older cultures in Europe where there were sensibilities that nature is sacred, that all beings, animals, birds, plants are in soul, they have a soul, a spirit, and uh, as well as sentience. Um, so to, to find the roots in these uh, older cultures. I'm going to be drawing on some of my poems that have been inspired by landscapes in Australia, Scotland and the southwest of England. These are all places that I have lived. And I will explain how my work is socially and ecologically engaged and has an activist intention which aims to highlight and restore ecological and cultural dimensions that Western industrialized societies, particularly my own, and as a white British person, have marginalized or erased. For me, this is poetry as restorative act and a signpost towards regenerative cultures where we value the earth, the land, the bioregion that we inhabit as our community. Um, so we might think also in this time of the climate crisis, uh, what does culture have to do with the climate crisis? And we can say actually everything uh, this is a, a quote from the artist, the British art, artist David Buckland, uh, with whom I am currently collaborating on a project. I will explain more about this later. And his statement is, climate change is a reality caused by us all. It is a cultural, social and economic problem and must move beyond scientific debate. Cape Farewell, this is the name of his artistic organization. Cape Farewell is committed to the notion that artists can engage the public in this issue through creative insight and vision. So I want to uh, share with you this beautiful map, which is, uh, as I'm sure you can all recognize, a map of Britain and Ireland, the British Isles. Um, and it is a map that does not show borders or political uh, regions, but um, the rivers, all the rivers uh, through, through these islands. And I have lived in, in these different places and I have written about the landscapes of these different places. So Fintorn Bay, right up in the northeast of Scotland. 
uh, in the southwest uh, of England, Froome in Somerset, which is currently where I live, and then right down on the south coast, uh, Pool Bay in the county of Dorset. Um, so I am currently working on a project um, which is looking at uh, pollution, uh, which is entering the river system and feeding into Pool Bay. And as part of my work, I have been uh, exploring uh, the land around the bay, but also the waters of the bay. And in this picture, uh, I was on a boat with uh, the oceanographer, uh, John Humphreys, and uh, a fellow artist, Anna Fridgstein, who is from the Netherlands. And so we were uh, exploring the bay and learning from, from this scientist. And all uh, of my landscape eco-poetry has been uh, based in research uh, informed by science, um, but also my own independent research. I, I do not have a background as a scientist. Uh, my background is in the arts, humanities, um, but I'm very interested in science, uh, but also other ways of knowing, uh, which I will also talk about uh, in a little while. So uh, I'm going to talk about, um, about three of uh, my long landscape poems. This one, uh, the most recent, is called Dorset Water Bodies, A Common Wheel. And I just wanted to explain this title because even for British people, the, the name Common Wheel is not necessarily uh, completely obvious what it means. So the word Common Wheel is a, uh, an archaic form of the word commonwealth. And this word, as you may know, is related to the British Empire and the sense of the different countries that the British colonized, the sense of the commonwealth. Of course, it was not very commonly shared, the wealth. Um, but uh, this word common wheel also means the general welfare. And then the word wheel has another meaning which means uh, a red swollen mark left on flesh by a blow or pressure. Um, so I'm, I'm playing with these uh, notions simultaneously in this, in this poem. Um, and as part of the project, I'm also collaborating with a filmmaker, James Murray White, and so I'm making some poetry films, uh, which will be screened. We have uh, a project uh, to coincide with COP26, which, as you know, I'm sure will be in, uh, held in, in Scotland, in Glasgow in November, uh, for all the political leaders to try to reach more uh, of an agreement about how to address the climate crisis. Personally, I don't have so much hope that they will create any real solutions, but um, as part of this uh, period of time, we want to host uh, an exhibition in Lighthouse Gallery in Poole, and we will have a poetry exhibition, po screening of poetry films, and the other artists who I'm collaborating with will also share their work, um, visual art, sculpture, etc. Um, so this is another poem I will refer to, Findhorn Bay, Waves of Flow and Flight. Uh, this one I created in 2018 as part of a community art project. Um, and I collaborated with a group of artists celebrating uh, the wildlife of Findhorn Bay, which is a large tidal estuary, uh, as you saw a map on, on the northeast coast of Scotland. And I had been living in the area for two years and I was uh, involved in a campaign to try to stop the shooting, the hunting of the wild geese who come to spend the winter 
in this bay. It is a nature reserve officially, but there are many hunters who come sometimes from big distances to shoot the geese. Um, they are pink-footed geese, very beautiful. And they, they spend the summer up in the high Arctic where they breed, and then they come to Fintorn Bay to spend the winter. And uh, many of the hunters, they shoot them, they don't even collect the bodies of the geese, so they, they don't even want to eat them. It's just for sport. sport. Um, so I wanted to respond artistically and to lend my solidarity um, by uh, writing about this landscape, by writing about uh, this issue and sharing it as part of the Fintorn Bay Arts Festival in 2018. Um, there is also a recording that I made of the poem with uh, a sound artist Vision Sonic. Um, it is on my, my SoundCloud, um, Helen Moore, Eco Poet, if you want to listen to it later. Uh, I don't think we have the sound connected very well here, so I won't try to, to, to play it, but um, I'll give you a little reading from it uh, in a little while. And then the third landscape uh, poem that I want to refer to is one um, that I created in 2015, 2016 in my current hometown of Froome in Somerset. And so this one is more of an urban landscape and um, it was a project that was funded by Heritage Lottery funding and it was uh, the intention was to help the people of this community to connect with the heritage of the ancient forest of Selwood, which was once a huge forest which covered the area and now there are only small vestiges of this forest left. Um, of course here in Italy you have some very huge areas of forest in Britain. We have a very, very small percentage of our original forest left. So it's very important for us to uh, help people to recognize uh, the significance of this heritage of the forest and to also support uh, communities to uh, plant new trees, new forests. And so this was a part of the engagement, the social engagement. Uh, that I was involved in. And, uh, so as part of the project, we were um, taking people on forest walks and uh, organizing community tree planting days. We had an exhibition in the local museum, the heritage of the forest. And I created this long poem from Selwood and Odyssey as part of, of the project. And uh, it is, uh, pub this one is published in my most recent collection, The Mother Country. Um, and this book also connects with landscapes in Australia. So as you may recognize, this is Sydney in Australia. Um, this is the place where in 1788, the British first invaded uh, the Australian continent. I use this word invaded. It is not a word that British people would normally use, but I use it in solidarity with indigenous Australian people who, who refer to it as an invasion by the British. This is the place uh, in the Sydney Harbour where the British first landed in 1788. And this uh, little cove uh, was originally a site for uh, male initiation, um, a borer ground as Aboriginal people refer to it. For the British and for uh, modern Australians, it is called Farm Cove uh, because this was the place where the British created the first farm. Um, there is a myth that is perpetuated in Australia that Indigenous Australian people were not farmers. Um, this is quite untrue. Um, so anyway, I won't go into that too much um, right now. So 
as part of the, the poems uh, in this book, The Mother Country, I wanted to explore the landscape of uh, the Sydney region and to try to uh, imagine how it might have looked before the British invasion, so the pre-colonial landscape. So part of my project was to try to find uh, a sense of what, what it might have looked like, for example, ancient trees. Um, this one is maybe 250, 300 years old. It is a, a fig tree uh, from the Pacific uh, region. So it, it could have been a young tree before the British uh, colonised uh, Australia. So I'd like to uh, share with you uh, one of the poems uh, that I wrote in response to uh, my uh, research in the pre-colonial Australian landscape. Um, this word biophony, again, it's not a word that many British people would immediately understand. I don't know how it translates into Italian, maybe some of you might recognise it, but it is the word that ecologists use to refer to the wild music of uh, an ecosystem. So the sounds of the birds, the animals, uh, we might be especially conscious of this music, the wild music at dawn and at dusk. Certainly this morning uh, from my hotel window here on Isola Polvese, I heard all the birds in the trees, I heard the biophony of this uh, beautiful island. Now what's interesting is that uh, this term biophony um, cr was created by a white uh, American uh, anthropologist, uh, ecologist, and uh, Bernie Krauts, he's called, and for him, biophony does not include humans. So he says that uh, human, human sounds uh, should be designated, <coughs> designated as anthropophony, and the noise that the earth makes, and the noise of rivers, uh, etc., earthquakes, is geophony. But uh, I found myself contemplating the notion of this separation of the human uh, from the landscape. And um, particularly, I think it's problematic uh, in an uh, indigenous context. And so this poem is an attempt to speak to this problem. And um, so the title, Biophony, Prior to uh, name Waran is the indigenous Australian name for, for the Sydney uh, area where the British first arrived. 1787 is one year before the British arrived. So I, I'll just read you uh, the poem. Here, at the edge of day, the land articulates a wild music to assure itself that it has stayed despite night's perpetual wash, the thieving of shadows. Resuming its rounds, sun glitters the Pacific rim as kookaburra, currawong, whipbird, crow, magpie goose, galah, lorikeet, cockatoo, emu, brolga, frog, cicada, sing it up. A unique colour springing from the throat of each at dawn's advance, variant hues and tones infuse the land. Song gilding the creams and yellows of sandstone. Song greening cover, silvering branches, trunks. Song lightening the crab holes, mud of mangrove, salt marsh. Song, above all, defining the soul of the cove. No one voice displaces another, whilst the orchestration improvised through evolutionary time resonates with call and 
response. Amongst it all, people sit by the smoking embers of their fires. Drawing breath into their lungs, they pour sonic rainbows into country, communing with ancestral lines unbroken for 20,000 generations. So um, this is uh, a museum in Sydney, uh, the barracks where uh, people who were brought on the first ships uh, from England and Scotland uh, would sleep. And of course the, the invasion by the British was also a horrible incident uh, for the social fabric um, of uh, my country. Um, many poor people who were uh, put into prisons just for stealing a loaf of bread. Um, this is the, the time of the Industrial Revolution. There was a huge amount of poverty, a growing chasm between the rich and the poor, which of course continues and is now contemporaneously becoming more and more exaggerated. Um, so people were on uh, sometimes um, prison ships waiting in the ports uh, of the south of England because there was no more room in the prisons on land. And eventually the solution was to send them to the Australian continent to uh, settle uh, there and to provide labor to bring back the materials that the mother country, Britain, needed for the industrialization process. So of course many sheep were taken to uh, the Australian continent. Huge areas of rainforest were cut down to create pasture for the sheep. Um, so, and um, as you may know, also the history of Scotland, the highlands of Scotland, many of the Gaelic speaking people, Celtic heritage uh, people, were cleared from their lands. Sometimes their houses were set on fire and they were forcibly evicted uh, to allow this process uh, to happen. Most of the landlords were either from England or from the low, uh, lowland uh, Scotland, so Glasgow, Edinburgh, the, the lowlands as opposed to the highlands. So you have a massive uh, movement of people who are displaced as refugees, uh, some of them living in Glasgow uh, on the streets. They couldn't speak English. Uh, it was a really terrible um, cultural genocide for the, the Gaelic speaking people. So many of them would have ended up uh, in the early days of the British colony uh, sleeping, sleeping here. So yeah, for me, I always want to bring together the ecological and the social in my poetry. They, they are completely connected. And this image uh, for me summarizes uh, the interconnection of the ecological and the social. Um, so the context of my work is made with full awareness of the white supremacist, patriarchal, imperialist, industrialist, capitalist system that we are all living with at the moment. More deeply, I want to also address uh, the, the, the roots of this crisis um, as a crisis of perception and imagination. And I will explain more about uh, this statement. Um, But of course, before I, before I go into that a little bit more, as a crisis of perception and imagination, poetry has something to speak to because perception and imagination, of course, are completely the territory of the, the poet, of the writer. So as I'm sure many of you will be aware, one of the contributors to the crisis of perception, at least, uh, the French philosopher René Descartes, 
um, and this was his illustration of the separation that he perceived between the mind and the body. Um, I'm sure you will all uh, know the famous uh, statement from, from Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And so this uh, contributed in the period that is called the Enlightenment, uh, strangely, um, to a notion of the separation of the human from nature and of nature from culture. And this is why we have arrived today uh, with the climate crisis, with the widespread ecological and social crises, uh, I firmly believe. He was one of many, but uh, he's, he's a good scapegoat. And this uh, separation, now we can see it uh, in our language, the language we use uh, to speak um, about our world. So for me, one of uh, the words that I find deeply problematic uh, is this word environment. And this uh, uh, statement, we recycle to protect our environment. This is a, a slogan that uh, is put on the recycling boxes uh, in, in, in England. So every, every Monday I put out my, all my recycling onto the street for collection and every Monday I read this statement, we recycle to protect our environment. And I always find it very problematic because it is so abstract. What does it mean, our environment? So I've tried to uh, pull it apart, if you like. So, so this is my attempt to try to unravel what it means. So we could say, we recycle to protect what is around us. This is literally the meaning of the word environment, what is around us. Um, we recycle to protect the web of life. Maybe that's a bit better. We then notion, have notions of the interconnected web of life. We recycle to protect water, air, soil, food. We recycle to protect what flows into us. We recycle to protect ourselves and all beings. We recycle to protect our shared body. So how would it be if instead of we recycle to protect our environment, we had on our recycling boxes, we recycle to protect our shared body with the understanding that our shared body is, is our planet. Um, maybe we would have a different culture if this was the kind of language uh, that, we, that we used. So I want to continue to look at uh, our, uh, issues around the way we perceive our world and the way we talk about our world. So this is an image from the Australian uh, landscape uh, photographer Alex Frame. You might look at this photograph and think, wow, it's beautiful and aesthetically, yes, it is beautiful, the colours, the composition. But in fact, this landscape is deeply pro problematic. Um, you may know the work of the Australian eco-poet John Kinsella. Um, this uh, photograph is taken in Western Australia in what is called the Wheat Belt, uh, this area where they grow huge amounts of wheat. And uh, John Kinsella writes about the Wheat Belt. It's where he lives. And this is an area, of course, the land has been appropriated from the indigenous peoples. It is a land that is a monoculture. Uh, it is a land full of toxic chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, which enter the, the water systems. It, they are crops which require huge amounts of water. Um, Australia is largely a desert um, continent. And so to irrigate many Australian crops takes 
huge amounts of water from the rivers, from the aquifers. And there is a growing problem in Australia with rivers uh, disappearing and, of course, the impacts for the wider ecosystems. So actually, when I look at that photo, I think this is a nightmare, um, not something at all beautiful. It's something very ugly. Um, For, for us uh, in uh, English language, the word landscape has uh, these connotations of, uh, it, it includes the, the visible landforms such as mountains, hills, water bodies, rivers, etc. It, it will include types of vegetation, so forests, etc. It will absolutely include man-made anthropogenic features, structures. Um, it will uh, describe the types of land use by industrialized humans. It will, uh, of course, refer to the aesthetic values. And landscape shapes uh, human identity um, in different ways. And it's seen of course, uh, within the capitalist economic system, ultimately as a potential resource for exploitation. But what is completely not included in notions of landscape is a sense of the interconnected ecosystem or of any sense of the sacred web of life. This is just totally absent. And um, I know here you have chingale. They are a very favorite uh, animal of mine, so much I actually have one tattooed on my arm. <laughs> and um, in Britain, these animals were uh, made extinct, but now we have uh, ways to, to uh, reintroduce them in Scotland and certain parts of the UK, Wales as well. And uh, we have a movement called the rewilding movement. And uh, in the rewilding movement, uh, which is part of the regenerative culture that I want to uphold as an eco poet, um, the, uh, the wild boar, as we call them, um, are seen as forest engineers uh, because they have a, a big role in shaping uh, the forest. Uh, when they uh, dig into the ground, often they are burying seeds, uh, they are uh, transforming the landscape and uh, supporting the, um, the, the flora of the uh, forest ecosystem in different ways. Um, of course, sometimes their populations get too big if their predators are absent from the ecosystem. And, and this this can be a problem, but uh, they have a very important role uh, in the ecosystem. So I've included here also a little uh, extract from uh, my poem, Froome, Selwood and Odyssey. So Froome is now a, a, a fairly big town, which was founded in the middle of the forest. Um, but uh, in the Anglo-Saxon period, when the, when the town was first founded in the 8th century. Um, I'm sure these animals would have lived in this forest. And so for me, in an attempt to remember uh, the presence of these animals in, in my urban landscape, um, I, I wrote this uh, noticing the name uh, of a pub, the Blue Boar Inn. And, uh, so these lines here about the town. Across the street stands the Blue Boar Inn, the former drinking hole of bristly tribes that squelched on the riverbank and loudly drank their fill. Sial Hudu. So Sial Hudu is the Anglo-Saxon name, Selwood now in, in modern English and it refers to the type of trees that grew 
in the forest, the sallow, uh, which we also call the willow. Um, so they were, they were forests of, of willow and oak. Sial Hudu is the wonderful word. I'm also very interested in exploring notions uh, when we look at, at landscapes of, of wilderness and how um, this more often than not excludes the indigenous human presence. So I referred to that earlier with a poem by Ophany prior to invasion. And notions of wilderness uh, excluding indigenous human presences uh, led to the perception of the land as a terra nullius, a no man's land. And this is effectively a racist position which ju justified the colonization of the Australian continent. And um, I'm sure many of you here might be familiar um, with the uh, much revered British naturalist John Muir, who founded uh, the, the nature reserves um, in uh, America, um, where he, he moved uh, to live. Uh, but for him, uh, wilderness absolutely did not include the Native American people. He actually regarded them as inferior. Um, and so although he is a very famous figure um, still today in America, and in Scotland, which is where he was originally from. Um, the Sierra Club, which is a club that supports people to enjoy uh, the nature reserves in America. They have recently apologized for last year um, after Black Lives Matter. They, they actually made a statement uh, apologizing for, for the racism of their founder, uh, John Muir, which is obviously a good, good thing. Um, and uh, just a, a little note on actually recognizing how important indigenous people's presence in wilderness is. So this uh, takes us back to Australia again. Uh, in Australia, indigenous people had always had a practice of what they now call cultural burning. So they would deliberately burn areas of the landscape. Um, and by doing this, it had a, a regenerative effect. There are certain plants on the Australian continent that actually need fire in order to set their seeds and to reproduce. Um, but also through this practice, it can prevent the huge forest fires uh, that we saw affecting the Australian continent uh, in 2019 uh, through to 2020. I was actually living in Australia at that time and I experienced it at first hand. So it is so important that we actually recognise uh, the thousands of generations of uh, knowledge, traditional knowledge that Indigenous peoples around the world hold um, in terms of managing and relating with, uh, with landscapes. So as you can see, there is such a need um, to, to read more deeply uh, into landscapes uh, in order to, to understand them. Um, I love this image, it's actually uh, from an eco-artist and she, she finds uh, pieces of rubbish and trash in the landscape and, and paints on them and then shows them against the, the, the landscape. It's quite interesting. Idea. So I just want to also, coming back to language and perception, um, share with you this quotation from the white Australian anthropologist, William Stammer, um, from his book, White Man Got No Dreaming. And he talks about uh, some of the problematic aspects of, of language, of, of the words that we use, um, and how different those words are for Indigenous Australian people. So he says, no English words are good enough to give a sense of the link between an Aboriginal group and its homeland. Our word home, warm and suggestive though it may be, 
does not match the Aboriginal word that, that, that may mean camp, house, country, everlasting home, totem place, life source, spirit center, and much else all in one. So already we can see that for indigenous people, the land is sacred, it has spirit. Um, our word land, the English word land, is too spare and meager. We can now scarcely use it except with economic overtones, unless we happen to be poets. Interesting. This is uh, another um, of my poems from the mother country. And I just wanted to share with you, it was uh, an attempt to try to um, show the richness of the, uh, the land in the Sydney area, uh, pre-colonial landscape. There were many attempts by the British to uh, reduce uh, any notions of the biodiversity that existed, but also how it was an essential food source for indigenous peoples. So there is this statement here from Captain David Collins, Deputy Judge Advocate of New South Wales, um, which is the region where Sydney is currently, as you may know, uh, from 1798. So this is just 10 years after the British invaded. So he wrote, the woods, exclusive of the animals which they occasionally find in their neighborhood, afford them but little sustenance. So he's basically saying, there's nothing there for them to eat. So my poem tries to uh, indicate something different. So I have used uh, some of the, the words that uh, are still known from the indigenous language of that region. There are many indigenous Australian languages across the continent, but this particular one, the Darug language. So this is mother tongue of the Darug language. Only a few hundred words remain. Yurungi, wild duck. Miral, crested pigeon. Bunmara, lizard. Midini, yam. Damun, Port Jackson fig. Danganua, tasty worm. Warrigal, greens. Gura gura, possum. Gurgi, bracken root. Midjurbury, lily pilly, fruit. Warangari, heather banksia, nectar, gaban, egg, gadibalang, good to eat. So, in sharing this with you, this is uh, pretty obvious, of course, the, the map is not the terrain. I actually love maps and uh, I spend a lot of time looking at maps. Uh, also maps from different centuries that uh, reveal sometimes how much the terrain has changed. So this, this smaller black and white map is actually from the 16th century and uh, it shows the same, the same area. So Fintorn Bay in the north of Scotland is also represented there in the middle. And if you look at the, the spit which is coming down from the left hand side, you can see it's actually different from uh, the more contemporary map. So it shows how the sea has affected the land. And so of course, this is a very clear uh, sign of how the map is not the terrain. The terrain is changing every day. Um, but because we often use maps, so uh, so much we can we can sometimes forget uh, that the map is not the terrain, and uh, it can when uh, landscapes are being explored um, or considered uh, for exploitation, uh, they they become a very reductive tool um, because of course they they do not in any way represent the biodiversity of, of the land. Of the terrain. Um, and so my next uh, little excerpt that I want to share from you is from this most recent poem that I've been working on, 
uh, Dorset water bodies, a common wheel. And this is from, it's a, as I mentioned earlier, it's a long poem. All of my landscape poems are long poems. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and this poem is an attempt to, to try to, to show uh, in the voice of a river, uh, giving voice to, to a river that the, the, the map and the terrain are not the same. Don't call us river as if we were singular, a blue serpentine line on a map, an S from source to estuary, an abstraction to be navigated, straightened, fished, dredged, a gaping mouth for waste, disposal. If you must make us river, Sense our communities of muds, mollusks, marshes, mires, of sedge fen with moorhen and shy water rails, of wet woodland and car where scrubby willows touch, tussock sedge, lichens, moss. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, my eco-poetic practice and um, how I believe that uh, actually as a culture we need to move beyond what we might call as cognocentrism which is where we make the thinking mind the totality of our uh, perception of the world and in fact there are five ways of knowing um, they are sensing with all our, our five senses, sight, hearing, smell, touch, taste, feeling, so our emotional uh, body, our uh, intuition, our imagination, and thinking. So I put thinking at the bottom and, and in a smaller font to uh, indicate that yeah, it's of course really important, but uh, maybe we need to value it a little bit less. So this is very much central to my practice, my creative practice as an eco-poet. I want to try to value uh, all these ways of knowing. So when I'm out exploring uh, the land, um, I try to switch off my mind and to be more in my, my body, my my humanimal body, um, feeling, intuiting, sensing, and using this, uh, these ways of knowing to, to make a response. For me, um, eco-poetry is uh, an interdisciplinary practice. Um, here, I've, I'm just sharing this uh, image from uh, an American artist from 1893 of the geological chart. Um, as an eco-poet, I'm very interested in geology, um, as well as ecology, archaeology, social history, uh, cultural and intuited aspects of place. So for me, the landscape is like a palimpsest with all these layers um, that you can read into and discover. I'm very influenced by uh, this statement from the modernist uh, poet Ezra Pound. Poets are the antennae of the human race. And I think as poets, as writers, we have that uh, sensitivity um, to, to, uh, to intuition, to imagination, to feeling, perhaps in ways that uh, other people uh, haven't necessarily uh, cultivated or even they've deliberately desensitized themselves in order to function in the capitalist economy. Um, of course, as poets, we have to function in the capitalist economy too, but uh, perhaps we have this capacity to be the antennae and to connect with the world uh, in, in different ways. So as I'm sure it's already very clear, I am uh, working with scientists, um, using research, uh, which is validated, uh, but bringing it together with the, the poetic, the imaginative realm. Um, 
and also uh, using uh, the imagination as uh, a platform for uh, developing more compassion for all beings, uh, not just for the humans, uh, but for, for all beings. Um, I love this quote from the British novelist, uh, Lindsay Clark, who says, compassion is an act of the imagination. And so for me, uh, this creative process can almost be like a, a shape-shifting, becoming more animal, but actually really fundamentally inhabiting my own nature as human animal. We often forget that we are animals. Um, so I use this word human animal to try to show that we have the synthesis uh, of human and animal. And, uh, so my, my, uh, we, uh, we share sentience and uh, amongst other aspects um, with, with the more than human world. So yeah, that was that was me exploring my humanimal nature. Um, I mentioned at the beginning the, the connection with the uh, European animistic tradition, and so I very much see my work uh, in that um, tradition, and I have a sense of wanting to reclaim uh, my ancestral roots as an eco poet um, within that. Um, this is a little quote from an Anglo-Saxon uh, poem, The Nine Herbs Charm. Um, I think in, in this time, uh, poetry would have had other functions. It would have been connected also with practices for healing, for giving medicines. And so this might have been recited by a witch or uh, a healer um, as she or he uh, delivered or prepared uh, some kind of uh, medicine from collected herbs. Um, this particular herb um, is usually perceived as a weed, uh, something to be sprayed with glyphosate, um, but actually a very potent herb um, called plantain or uh, broad, uh, broad, a uh, wayboard uh, in the Anglo Saxon tradition because uh, it often appears. Uh, uh, along paths, roads, uh, ways. So I love this um, little quote from this charm. And thou wayward, mother of herbs, open to the east, mighty within, over you chariots creep. Queens have ridden over you, brides have moaned over you. Over you bulls gnash their teeth, all these you did withstand and resist. So may you withstand poison and infection and the foe who fares through the land. It's quite interesting reading that in the time of COVID now and uh, <laughs> how that might relate. And uh, I just wanted to also share with you a little uh, excerpt from this poem, Fintorn Bay, Waves of Flown Flight, to show how this connection with the ancient animistic tradition uh, is woven into my, my own poetry. Um, so this uh, image here is from um, a grave, a tomb, uh, that was discovered near Fintorn Bay in the north of Scotland. And on it, you can see the, the goose, the pink-footed goose, and the salmon. And these are two iconic uh, creatures from this uh, region. Um, as I mentioned before, that the geese are hunted even in the nature reserve of the bay. Uh, the salmon, they are fished from the rivers and their numbers are dramatically decreasing due to a mix of different factors, most of them anthropogenic, uh, including the climate crisis. Uh, as the, as the uh, Atlantic is warming, uh, their food sources are moving further and further north. Uh, so this is one problem. Another problem is fish farms and there are sea lice um, that uh, affect the, the farm salmon and they can transfer to the wild uh, salmon and they really affect the health of, of the salmon. So this stone was found inside a tomb um, and it's 
believe that maybe these creatures, because they were migrant creatures, uh, appearing and disappearing at different times. As you will know, the salmon uh, also disappear from the rivers. They travel up to the Arctic to feed and then they return as the, as the geese do. And um, so perhaps there was a sense in putting this stone inside the tomb next to the head of the, the dead person that it was believed it might remind the dead person that their spirit could return. So this is a little uh, excerpt. The, this, uh, the culture that this stone is from is from the Pictish culture, which is before the Celtic peoples in the north of Scotland. Um, pink feet rise up and settle back even further in time. 1,500 years ago in this Pictish kingdom of Fortri, Rohid, its royal seat, a world where goose and salmon were revered, incised together in stone, then placed in a burial kist on land now known as Easterton of Rosile. And was being laid in that house of the dead, a blessing for the deceased, a spirit journey to other worlds, but with these totem companions promising return. So I'm coming towards the end of my talk, just a, a few more uh, images to share with you. So for me, part of my role as an eco-poet is to be an advocate for the more than human world. Um, uh, to, to speak up for those who can't speak themselves. Well, of course they speak, they have their own languages, but we don't understand them and they don't speak our language. So. Uh, Part of my sense of my role is uh, to, to advocate. I am very influenced by the American eco-poet Gary Snyder, and he very much uh, takes on this uh, sense of responsibility too. Um, he, he writes, that, uh, Gary Snyder writes that tuning into other voices than simply the social or human voice is about being an early warning system that hears the trees and the air and the clouds and the watersheds beginning to groan and complain. And it is about advocating for a realm for which few people will stand up. So that's quite interesting. So I just want to talk a little bit about the genesis of one of my most recent poems. Um, the poem is called Nightmare Slurry Spill. Um, this word slurry you might not know. It's the, um, when, when cows are kept inside in industrial farming, um, their, their shit and piss uh, is collected and it is called slurry and it is stored in big tanks to slowly decompose over many months and then finally it can be used to return to fertilize the fields. Unfortunately, it is collected in big quantities when you have many, many cows uh, in, in big sheds, not out in the fields, uh, but in big sheds, the volume of their, of their excrement uh, becomes huge. And with climate crisis, often we are having big inundations of rain. So often this slurry can spill into rivers. And when this happens, um, the uh, bacteria in the rivers respond to consume the, the slurry, but the, because it's in such huge quantities, they consume all the oxygen in the river. So it can lead to the fish in the rivers and other uh, creatures who live in the rivers dying because they, they can't breathe. And um, I have been researching this uh, fact and uh, thinking about it a lot. And I was out uh, camping in my tent one night by a river in, in Dorset in the southwest of England. 
And uh, my experience was, uh, this is a, a story um, which led to, to the writing of this poem. Uh, I, was, I was sleeping and suddenly I heard the, the tent door opening and I felt this, this presence coming into my tent and sitting on top of me and trying to, to suffocate me. So afterwards, I was reminded of this painting that this that had the same kind of sense of this very dark energy coming in to uh, oppress me. This happened three times in the night, three occasions, the door opening, this presence coming in. And I was terrified. It was so scary. I was on my own camping by the river and it was a horrible, horrible experience. And find it. and it's one of those experiences where you can't speak, you can't move, you're just like. So um, subsequently, I realised that perhaps this was uh, the spirits of the river or the spirits of the fish uh, trying to show me what they experience when this pollution goes into the rivers and they are suffocating. It was interesting also that um, I uh, had this experience around the time also of Black Lives Matter and the um, black American man, George Floyd, being suffocated by the policemen. So I think this was also in my psyche. Um, anyway, I just want to uh, share this, uh, this poem. So it's an excerpt, it's not the whole piece. <clears throat> Nightmare slurry spill. Another foul tide tips into river and slim speckled fish are gasping for air. At night we dream of forces weighing us down, squatting soul and our struggle for oxygen, a slim speckled fish fighting extinction. Our mouths, silver rings bobbing in the filth, which robs oxygen and soul. Limbs pinioned to our sides, voices barely whisper. Mouths like silver rings bobbing in the filth. We cannot breathe. In toxic oblivion, hearts and gills float. Fins pinioned to our sides, voices unable to whisper who speaks for the voiceless. So just in my final few moments uh, of this presentation, I just wanted to share a little bit more about my use of the long form poem for these landscape pieces. Um, I love the long form poem um, because it has offers many possibilities for me as a poet. Um, so there are a sequence of thematically linked poems. You might compare it to a music album, a concept music album, where you have various tracks that can stand independently, but they are thematically linked. So um, this is uh, what I enjoy to, to explore. I enjoy it for the, the collage, cumulative effect, the section, different sections can juxtapose perspectives and voices, the human, the more than human, and the creation of a, a sculptural bio tapestry that reflects different elements of a landscape. So this most recent piece uh, that I've been working on, Dorset Water Bodies Commonweal, it's a long poem in five sections, which are thematically linked, but each one can stand alone. So the first one, mutual aid, cooperation is another way to say this word, mutual aid. And this, this is solely in the realm of humans. And then the second one, migrant story, is uh, the story also of a salmon uh, returning to the Arctic, returning from the Arctic back to 
Cool Bay to its natal river. Uh, chalk and cheese is about the geology, the chalk geology of the area. Nightmare slurry spill, I've just uh, shared with you. Fluvial, I've shared with you previously in the voice of the river. And this is just a little excerpt from uh, the piece, um, uh, Migration Story, uh, recounting the journey of the salmon as it returns from the Arctic. Outbound, her belly gnawed for hundreds of miles northward, food sources elusive with Atlantic warming. Now from Arctic waters, she fish come skirting our coastline, a silver torpedo fattened on capelin and eight tentacled squid. Attuned by an iron in her head to Earth's geomagnetic compass, hen salmon surfs, in-channel currents, lizard point, start point, Portland bill, where North Sea cools, Gulf Stream. And so you can see um, the way I like to arrange my uh, words, the text on the page. For me, um, poetry is like 2D sculpture. So I'm interested very much in the relationship between the words and the space. Also, sometimes different fonts and uh, you know, different size fonts. This is also because I'm preparing to make an exhibition, a poetry exhibition uh, in November, as I mentioned previously. So I've been looking even more at how to represent text um, for, for an exhibition. So finally, um, yeah, I'm sure it's completely clear. I have a very strong activist engagement and intention with my work. Ultimately, my aim is to encourage people to embrace a deeper sense of identity with the land, an ensouled, co-creative, interdependent vision. In this way, I hope my eco-poetry can serve as restorative act, a signpost towards regenerative cultures where we value the earth and particularly the land, the bioregion, we inhabit as our community. <laughs> so finally, this is my little provocation. I would like to see a future without eco-poetry. Collectively, we have no choice but to participate in creating a world for which our children's children will thank us. A world where eco-poetry will simply be poetry again. Thank you so much.